Revelation chapter 11, beginning with verse 15 and going to the end of the chapter. And then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came. And the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God which is in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, and sounds, and peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, as we continue to make our way through the book of Revelation, we pray that you might teach us about the things that are to come and that you might teach us about the things that are in the present. That you might teach us what our response to these future events must be in this present time. We pray it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, between Easter and my time traveling away, it has been the better part of a month since we've been in the book of Revelation, so I think some review may be in order. If you remember, the book of Revelation proceeds as a series of cascading sevens. There is, first of all, the seven seals, which, which give us the history of the, the Christian church from the time of the first coming of Christ until the second coming of Christ. And the seventh of those seals contains the seven trumpets. So the seven trumpets speak of God's initial wrath poured out upon the earth. And then the seventh trumpet contains the seven bowls, which we haven't gotten to yet. But those seven bowls speak of God's final wrath poured out on planet earth. We've seen thus far the sounding of the first six of those trumpets. And but before the seventh one sounded, there was an interlude of some time during which the seven thunders sounded and during which the two witnesses prophesied in Jerusalem for three and a half years. Those witnesses are then slain by the Antichrist who apparently this time shows his true colors as the demonized, godless, devil-inspired beast that he is. After maintaining a three and a half year peace treaty with Israel, during which time they rebuild their temple and they begin sacrificing again, now he breaks that treaty. And he not only breaks that treaty, he defiles the temple by taking his place in it, taking his seat in the temple and declaring himself to be God. That desecration of the temple happens at the midpoint of the final seven year period. Now, with the blowing of the seventh trumpet, the events of the last three and a half years commence. But here's the strange thing about this particular passage. When that seventh trumpet blows, nothing happens. When that seventh trumpet blows, we expect the bowl judgments to be poured out. But indeed, the bowl judgments won't be poured out until chapter 16. In the meantime, there's a gap there's a, 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 a time of, uh, of separation between the blowing of the seventh trumpet and the pouring out of the seventh bowls. Indeed, a gap that stretches for several chapters. In the interim, God shows us why this final wrath is poured out upon the unregenerate earth and more specifically upon the kingdom of the Antichrist and why those judgments are so severe. If it were not for the next few chapters, we might be tempted to think, well, God is being a little over, over judgment here. He's, it's a little bit of overkill. But when we see these next few chapters, we recognize that God's judgment is indeed righteous and fair. These last few verses of chapter 11 serve as an intro to this last outpouring of God's judgment in the seven bowls. And chapters 12 through 15 serve as the setup for this final wrath. So let's notice first of all this morning 
the outcome predicted. Verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. The final outcome of the bold judgments is that the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. But notice there that this declaration is in the past tense. Even though it's talking about something that's going to happen in the future, it's speaking in the past tense. It's fairly obvious that this has not happened yet. It's fairly obvious from the chapters we've already seen and the chapters we're going to see that the kingdom of the beast is going along just fine until the bold judgments are rained down upon it and it comes tumbling down. Understand that the past tense here is the language of prophecy by which the the prophets of the Old Testament would oftentimes speak of something that was going to happen in the future in the past tense. And the reason why they would do that is because God had given his word on it. And when God gives his word that something will happen, listen, it's as sure a thing as if it had already happened. And so they would oftentimes speak, some, speak of things that were going to happen in the future as if they had already happened. This is an announcement of conquest, of one kingdom completely overpowering another. It's a done deal. The outcome is not in question. It's just a matter of going through the motions. You may also have noticed that in some of your translations, the word kingdom in that verse 15 is plural. And those who are familiar with Handel's Messiah, no doubt, are singing the kingdoms plural of this world, have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The reason for the discrepancy is that some of the ancient manuscripts have it singular, kingdom, and others have it plural as kingdoms of this world. Either way communicates a great truth. In terms of seeing it as plural, it's important for us to understand that all of the kingdoms of this world all of the kingdoms of this world, the rulerships, the regimes, the, the governments, the hierarchies, the authorities, the powers, whatever they may be, may be, and whether they may be social, political, or whether they may be spiritual, all of those kingdoms will one day be completely subsumed under the kingdom of God. God is sovereign over all of the universe, but at the moment, there are significant portions of the earth that are in rebellion against his sovereign rule. That rebellion is both temporary and illusory. People fool themselves into believing they can shake their fist in the face of Almighty God without consequences. But the fact of the matter is that all rebellion against God will ultimately be put down and every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Listen, it's just like the old STP commercial. You can pay me now or pay me later. You can bow now or bow later. You can bow now in humble surrender to his rightful place as Lord and receive his salvation. Or you can bow later in humiliating defeat as all rebellion against his kingdom is crushed and receive his condemnation. But listen, you will bow. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. In terms of seeing kingdom there as singular, understand that even though there are many governments and rulers and authorities scattered throughout the world, there is ultimately one rival kingdom to the kingdom of God, and that is the devil's kingdom of darkness. He is the prince of this world. He is the nefarious puppet master pulling the strings behind evil men and evil governments. Right now, there is an ongoing struggle between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God on earth. The presence of the church indwelt by the Holy Spirit keeps that kingdom of darkness somewhat in check. It keeps that kingdom of darkness from being fully manifested upon the, the earth. But with the removal of the church... That kingdom of darkness will be fully manifested on earth in the final Antichrist kingdom with all of the worst elements of all previously previous oppressive kingdoms rolled into one. That kingdom, as we will see, will seem all-powerful, but it will be systematically destroyed by the bold judgments of God, completely invaded, defeated, 
and taken over by the higher power of the kingdom of God. And when that happens, he will indeed reign forever and ever. So we see the outcome predicted. Notice, secondly, the outpoured worship in verses 16 through 18. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bond servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. In response to the announcement of the Lord's impending victory and eternal reign, the 24 elders representing the redeemed of all the ages fall from their thrones onto their faces and worship God. Notice the contrast in these few verses here. Those who sin in rebellion against God occupy thrones in defiance of Him, but they will be forcefully and completely removed from those thrones. Those who live in submission to God are given thrones, representing authority in His kingdom, but they always voluntarily subsume their authority to His higher authority. Symbolized by falling from their thrones on their faces in worship. What they say in their worship in verse 18 is a quick preview, a thumbnail sketch of what's to come in the rest of the book of Revelation. The overpowering of all rebellion by the overpowering or overwhelming power of God. The final wrath of God poured out on earth and the judgment of the lost and the rewarding of the saved. Look at verse 17 where the 24 elders give thanks to God, saying, We give you thanks, O God, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Let me ask you a question there. Has God not always reigned? So what are they talking about here? They're saying, we're, we're thanking you, we're praising you, God, because you have begun to reign. Well, God's always reigned. God's always been sovereign. God's always been the sovereign Lord of the universe. In what sense is something changed here? Well, what's changed here is that God has begun to reign by His great power. Let me see if I can illustrate this for you. Suppose two guys named Bubba and Cletus walk into the post office in Hayhira, Georgia with shotguns and take over the place. And they declare that from henceforth that building is to be known as the sovereign nation of Bub Cletistan. Now obviously, the United States does not cease to exist because of their act of rebellion. And even though it may appear at first glance that they are in complete control of a certain portion of the United States, one federal building in Hayhira, the truth of the matter is, they're not in control at all, are they? Because the United States government has enough firepower to take back that building any time they so desire. But if you know anything about situations like that, the government is not going to go in with guns blazing, at least not immediately. No, they're going to send in negotiators to try to persuade Bubba and Cletus that their situation is hopeless and they need to give it up peacefully. But if those negotiations fail, the government will then do whatever it takes. They will use whatever force is necessary to remove Bubba and Cletus from their post office. As we said earlier, God is sovereign over all the earth. And even though there are people and systems in rebellion against His authority, right now during this age of grace, we are in the persuasion stage. As God, through His Word, His witnesses, and, His, and the wooing of the Holy Spirit are persuading people to give up their futile rebellion against Him, to receive His forgiveness of sin by repentance and faith, and to surrender to His Lordship. Even up to the preaching of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, God was still seeking to persuade. But at this point in the book of Revelation, persuasion time is over. Persuasion time has come to an end. God is taking back this planet by force. 
through the application of His almighty power. Notice third this morning, the open temple in verse 19, and the temple of God which is in heaven was opened, and the ark of His covenant appeared in His temple. The open temple. The Bible teaches that the earthly temple was a, a copy of the eternal temple in heaven. And here we see that temple in heaven opened and the Ark of the Covenant is seen in that temple in Old Testament times. The Holy of Holies, the innermost sanctum, was where the, the Ark of the Covenant sat. And it was completely corded off. Nobody ever saw the, the Holy of Holies. Nobody ever saw the Ark of the Covenant except for the high priest on the Day of Atonement and even his view of the Ark of the Covenant was obscured by the smoke that would be put in there before he got in there. But you remember that at the death of Jesus, that curtain that, that, curtain that cordoned off the Holy of Holies was ripped in two, symbolizing that because of Jesus' atoning sacrifice, all people now have access to God through Christ. Heaven is the removal of everything that separates us from full communion with God. But why is that symbol inserted here? Why is that symbol of, of access to God and access to the throne of God, why is that inserted here? Well, if you remember from the last message, if my understanding is correct, the murder of the two witnesses in Jerusalem corresponds with an event not mentioned in Revelation, but that is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. And that's the Antichrist defiling the temple by declaring himself to be God there, by taking his seat on a throne there and declaring himself to be God. That act defiles the temple as a place of sacrifice and as a place of worship. But listen, even if the earthly temple is closed for business, the heavenly temple is always open to God's children. Even though an interloper has enthroned himself as God in that earthly temple, the true throne is secure in the heavenly temple. And the true God still reigns. So we see the open temple. And lastly, we see in the latter part of verse 19, the ominous signs. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. A number of times already in the book of Revelation, we've seen those meteorological signs at various times, and they always indicate the same thing, that judgment is coming. And I would say to you this morning that judgment is, in fact, coming. Not just on those who live in the terrifying days of wrath recorded in Revelation. I have no idea how far in the future these events might be. Maybe in our lifetime. Maybe beyond our lifetime. But I do know this. The days of everyone sitting in this room are numbered. And only God knows the number. The Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes judgment. That judgment will deal with one issue, whether or not you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're not in Christ this morning, you're in rebellion against God, and you abide under His condemnation. But even in your rebellion, God loves you so much that He was willing to make a way for you to be saved. Jesus, the perfect sinless Son of God, died on the cross as your substitute and sacrifice, paying the price for your sins. He offers you forgiveness and eternal life, but you must receive it by turning from your sins and repentance, placing your faith in Him and what He did on the cross, surrendering your life to Him. He's persuading you to give up your futile rebellion and receive His pardon today. Won't you receive Him and come out of the kingdom of darkness and into His kingdom of light today? In just a moment, we're going to stand together. We're going to sing an invitation hymn. As the Lord speaks to your heart today, He may be speaking to you about salvation. 
that you need to pray and ask Him to come into your life, and then that you need to step out and come forward publicly professing your faith in Him. He may be speaking to you about church membership. You're a child of God, you don't have a local church home. And the Lord may be calling you to unite with Calvary and become a part of what God is doing here at this church. Maybe today that you're a child of God and the Lord has put His hand on some things in your life that are not as they should be. Oh yes, if you died today or the Lord returned today, you would go to be with Him, but you'd be embarrassed that there are some things in your life that are not as they should be. And He's calling you today to get that right before the time that you stand before Him. However, the Lord may be dealing with you today as we stand together and sing our invitation Him, won't you come? Our invitation to Him is just as I am. You come to the Lord just as you are. He won't leave you just as you are, but you come to Him just as you are. So we stand together. I'll be down front to meet you. You come.